Hi guys, it's pretty early in the morning here in London and it's still dark outside, it won't get light for about another hour but from what I can see it looks like a pretty average winter's day, cold, wet, pretty miserable all round. But I'd like to produce more content for my channel and certainly more frequently and with my busy work schedule there's really only one way that's going to happen and that is if I include some of my work in the videos. It was in fact the original reason I started the channel as one of the social media platforms for my business. But like most people's first videos, they sucked. So I went off and started making videos about other things, more interesting things, and they've been pretty popular, but I want to revisit my work and feature it in some way in the videos. And as I said, hopefully that will mean I can produce more and more frequently. So this is gonna be the first of those videos. It's really inspired by daily vloggers. The vloggers and filmmakers that produce or aim to produce videos and vlogs back to back every 24 hours. Now I'm not in a position to do that and I don't see myself being in a position to do it every 24 hours. But I thought I'd try it at least once and today is the day. So we're gonna start off with a run along the river, taking some of the sights, then off to work. Oh, first of all, hopefully we'll have time for some coffee and breakfast, off to work and then afterwards dinner, maybe drinks, it's a Monday, so definitely dinner, but Let's get started, let's go.
Right, that's it for today. Time to turn around and go home. It's starting to rain a little. This is Albert Bridge. It looks great at night when it's lit with fairy lights. Maybe I'll try and capture sunset here tonight and show you that. It spans the River Thames and connects Chelsea to Battersea. This is sunrise. I know it's cloudy, but if you squint, you can just see the sun coming up on the horizon there. Maybe the last time we see it today. Sunrise at the moment is just before 7 a.m. and sunset is around 4.30. So if it's overcast like today, many people have to go to work in the dark and then come home in the dark. As you can see, today London's pretty overcast with clouds. So far today there have been intermittent light rain showers and that looks set to continue. Those clouds look like it could get worse before it gets better. But right now it's dry. It's technically still autumn right now and officially still autumn until the end of December. Our coldest three months are usually December, January and February. I think most people if asked though would say this is the start of winter. The gap between autumn and spring is definitely longer than 12 weeks in my mind and we're certainly a long way from summer. The days or the daylight hours are pretty short and it's definitely getting colder. That's today's run done. I use the Nike running app to track my runs. For me, a short run is three to five miles and a long run is 10. I really look at it in a month by month basis because each week for me is different. So if I'm running multiple times in a week, I'll do multiple short runs. If I'm running infrequently, I'll do long runs and try and match or improve my distance on a monthly basis. Okay, now I'm washed and dressed, we can get started. Outfit of the day, shirt from Cordings on Piccadilly, blue Levi's jeans, and right now I'm wearing a pair of Uggs. It's cold, it's winter, don't judge me, I don't leave the house in them. Before we do anything else, let's make some coffee. Before we go anywhere today, I'm gonna to make some coffee, some espresso. Before I make espresso though, let's just talk a little about what you need to make great coffee at home. I wouldn't start with attempting espresso and getting all the gear to do it. Build up with some simpler methods first. Let's make some. The, the French press or cafetiere are a great place to start. Many have glass jars. I've had a lot. They are great, but we kept smashing them through daily use combined with clumsiness. So we eventually got a double-walled steel one from a catering suppliers. They're very simple to use, quick to use, so long as you put good coffee and good water in, very forgiving, it's very difficult to make a bad cup of coffee with one. Pre-ground coffee will have lost much of its character to the extent I wouldn't bother. Whole roasted beans that you can freshly grind are better, so you'll need a grinder. This, focus, this is a hand grinder. Great inexpensive tool. We use the massive electric one for espresso as you need finer control of the grind size and for speed. This Japanese hand grinder is very simple to use. You put the required quantity of beans in the top, replace the cap, fit the handle, and then turn away on the handle. You can feel and hear when all of the beans have been ground through and then you'll have freshly ground coffee in the bottom. There is one thing you cannot make a good cup of coffee without, regardless of the brewing method or the equipment used. One thing, good ingredients. Good coffee and good water. Water 
is simple. Get a water filter, especially here in London, one of the jugs, or use bottled water. It will improve the taste of your coffee and your machines will last longer. Don't get me wrong, they go to extreme lengths to ensure London tap water is fit for drinking. I drink London tap water. There's nothing wrong with it. I have done all my life to the extent I find softer, cleaner waters unpalatable. UK tap water is the most stringently tested in the world. Bottled water is a convenience and a lifestyle choice, but it is in fact subject to far less stringent safety tests than tap water here. And so it is also much more likely to be contaminated or become a source of infection. It's, it's just the taste of the dissolved solids within tap water will not improve the taste of your coffee and filtering them out also means you can dissolve a touch more coffee in their place, in theory at least. Okay, so we've ground up that batch of coffee. The French press or cafetiere, whichever you prefer to call it, is very simple to use. We simply put the ground coffee in the bottom, top up with near boiling water, and then replace the lid, slowly press down on the filter. And then once the filter's at the bottom, you can let it sit, let it steep for a few minutes, and then pour away and have some delicious, fresh coffee. When it comes to coffee, most people here in London will settle for something of tolerable quality so long as it's scalding hot and delivers the all-important kick of caffeine. I can tell by all the branded paper cups I see people clasping on their march to work each morning. But here in London, we have easy access to amazing, world-class, freshly roasted speciality coffee. And it's certainly not confined only to London or the UK. I buy coffee from quality roasters or coffee retailers. The bags have a roasted on date so you can tell how fresh they are. And the characteristics change in the days following roasting. So if you tell the retailer what method you're using, they can recommend a good one for that purpose. You don't necessarily want them super fresh out of the roaster, especially for espresso. For the first few days after roasting, I think coffee is better for immersion or percolation brewing like the French press or pour over method. And then after a week or two is better for espresso, but a good retailer can recommend a good batch for your chosen method. Okay, let's make some espresso. I can't repeat this enough. The thing you need to make the best coffee is the best ingredients, and luckily there are only two, coffee and water. Water is simple. If you have hard water, like here in London, filter it or use filtered water. It will simply taste better and your machine will last longer. For the coffee, get whole bean, not pre-ground. You'll need freshly ground. Look for a quality roaster local to you. We've got a few in London. If you live in the middle of nowhere, well, you need the internet to watch this so you can order some online. Today, I'm using workshop coffee. The bag has the roasted on date and a harvest date so we can see it's fresh. Even with all the gear, a grinder and an espresso machine, making great espresso requires trial and error and fine tuning, so you'll need to record your results. You're going to need scales to measure your coffee. Two of the variables you'll need to measure are weight and time, so these scales have a clock on also. But this Sage dual boiler has its own built-in clock, so we won't need the timer today. But I do with my other manual lever machines. There are three main variables you can control three parameters you'll need to change actually let's say four there is one always overlooked to reach your personal preference for espresso the first thing is grind size the setting on your grinder little differences in finesse have big differences in the outcome the second thing is the dose the weight of the coffee you put in the portafilter or basket and we use the scales to, to weigh that to measure that Third, and often overlooked, is tamping pressure. The weight you compact it into the basket. If you're weak, it doesn't matter. Press as hard as you can. If you're strong, don't press as hard as you can. The aim is consistency. You can practice with bathroom scales when you begin to ensure you're not exceeding a reasonable pressure and to become consistent. If your tamp pressure varies, so will every extraction. The fourth thing is extraction time. How long it takes for the water to flow through the coffee. I'm just going to flush the machine to make sure it's clean. As you can see, I've got 20 grams of freshly ground coffee in the porter filter. The machine is set to 30 seconds extraction time and a water temperature of a few degrees below boiling. It's the default settings in the machine and includes pre-infusion, I guess. So I just work with that. You can adjust it endlessly, though. The grinder setting takes a while to perfect to dial into the machine settings. Too fine and nothing comes through, too coarse a grind and the water will flood through. Finding a sweet spot in the middle takes a lot of little tweaks. 
groom the coffee with my fingers just so I'm tamping down on a flat even surface. For tamping you need to press hard enough that the coffee is compacted and so you have an even level surface so the water will hit it and flow through evenly. You can turn it upside down if it falls out you haven't done it hard enough. What we're measuring is the brew ratio, the yield in weight. So the amount of coffee produced in grams compared with the dose which was 20 grams. I'm just going to tear with the cup on so we've got an accurate measurement not including the cup. There are no rules to this, people like to make them but the rules are there to be broken. They do serve as guidelines to point you in the right direction. It's a matter of personal taste and that varies, especially globally. But here I'll put on screen a rough guide to the brew ratio. I think this is an Italian one and it actually errs on the longer and weaker. Some people would reduce these parameters but I think they're better for brewing at home than lower parameters because the pumps in these little machines are weaker than the industrial ones used in shops and the pressure is the same but the power and speed at which it's delivered is not. If you're short of time or patience at home I'd stick to one of the simple brew methods like the French press we looked at earlier or pour over. If you're looking for a quick simple solution and you must have espresso you can get your espresso from a shop or even one of the pod machines the Nespresso's. Getting espresso right at home takes a geek like obsession to set it up initially and every roast takes a little tweaking. So I've extracted 41.9 grams from 20 grams of coffee, a brew ratio of just over 1 to 2, so let's see what it tastes like. Mmm, that's good. I'm really enjoying this batch, this roast of workshop coffee. I think it could do with tweaking to be a little bit longer, but I think for now I'm going to leave the settings as they are, I'll see how I get on tomorrow. Right, this morning we have time for breakfast. I'm going to make a bacon sandwich. Chloe's just picked up some fresh bread from the bakers along the way, a fresh white bloomer. And I have some bacon in the fridge, some smoked back bacon. So let's get started. I'm going for three rashes of bacon for this sandwich today. I'm using a griddle pan. I'm going to toast the bread in it. When the bacon's cooked, you should put neat little lines across the bread. Good tip for you, if you like your bacon super crispy, a great way to achieve that is in the microwave and super fast. It gets it far crispier than you can in a pan and it doesn't burn it. Didn't believe it myself. I tried it. Try it. It's amazing. See how the toast's looking? Yeah, it's picked up some of the fat from that bacon and put the neat little lines across it. Okay, now the tricky decision, mustard, tomato ketchup or HP sauce. HP sauce today. I was out with friends for dinner not so long ago. One of my friends, she's vegetarian. She said the one thing that makes her miss meat is the smell of bacon frying when she walks past cafes in the morning. She's also Jewish, so that then raised the question of why she's missing bacon. But that's a whole nother story. Okay, that's breakfast taken care of. A bacon sandwich, griddled bacon, toasted bread, and quite a generous dollop of HP sauce. It smells amazing. Right, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. I have a couple of meetings this morning in Hatton Garden and we can take a boat to Blackfriars and walk from there, it's not very far. Before the construction of London's now many bridges across the Thames and the underground, the River Thames was the major thoroughfare through London and for centuries. During the 19th century it became less appealing and less commercially viable. It wasn't one thing, it was just a whole series of events spanning decades, a century probably. Hackney coaches which developed into what we now know as the black taxi, the introduction of trams, trains, the car, buses. When they invented the flushing toilet in 1840 it turned the Thames into a sewer and it stank like one apparently for years until sewers were redesigned. The watermen who worked here formed unions. It was a Dickensian place to work apparently so that led to repeated industrial action. River transport transitioned from being essential to being almost obsolete. 
as you can see right now this morning there's nobody else here and there's barely a boat in sight on the river but right now at this time in the morning this is what the tube looks like Don't get me wrong, I love the tube really, I use it all the time. It goes to places the river doesn't, but during rush hour it's overcrowded. And that's a symptom of its success, not a symptom of its failure. It's fast and convenient, but crowded in rush hour. The new trains are a better design, they're more like tubes, one long tube. Much more spacious and higher capacity I guess, and they should help. But it's going to be a while before they're all replaced. I went to a rugby playing school and few things they teach you at school prepare you for real life. But rugby for five years? Locking into a scrum is much like boarding a tube train in rush hour. The central line is the one. It's deep and it's low ceiling trains mean the heat, the humidity and the aroma is just like a scrum too. I avoid the central line in summer, it's warm in winter and in summer it can get so hot it would technically be illegal to transport cattle on it as it would be considered inhumane. Passenger services have never disappeared entirely from the Thames. Tourist boats and party boats have always been here, but scheduled commuter services ended with all the paddle steamers going bust at the start of the 20th century. And they weren't reintroduced until this century. They're one of the legacies of the Millennium celebrations here in London. They built the dome, it was the Millennium Dome, it's currently the O2. The Millennium Wheel, which changes name with every new sponsor, but is generally now the London Eye. And they reintroduced boats, river buses to connect them all, and with access piers all along the Thames.
This is the Blackfriars Pier next to Blackfriars Bridge and the closest one to Hatton Garden where we are headed. So it's off the boat and off the relative tranquillity of the river and back into the rat race that is London's rush hour. They've started accepting oyster payment on the river this year which is great. If you're getting the boat don't touch in until you're actually boarding the boat. The system is visual. So the chap or the lady, I'm sure they must have a nautical title. I hope they have an elaborate title. The crew member, the able seaman. Welcoming you aboard needs to see the oyster card reader when you touch in. It lights up green if you have enough credit to pay for the, um, the voyage. Hatton Garden's a five minute walk from here from Blackfriars. Hatton Garden, how can I explain Hatton Garden? It's, it's the jewellery workshop of London. Historically it was primarily a place of manufacturing, supplying retailers, not actually retailing and the public were not really welcomed but today the street is lined with retail stores competing for the public's attention. And behind, below and above the shop facades remain the private hidden world of manufacturing, uh, repairs and restoration that supply the stores here and worldwide. It's a patchwork of buildings and small workshops, heavily guarded underground vaults where business has been done for well over a century now. Bond Street is more the home of luxury stores where the wealthy shop for jewellery and luxury goods but the items are not manufactured there and traditionally much of the goods probably would have been produced here. The marketplace is more global and brand orientated now so the goods will come from all over the world but people come to Hatton Garden for two reasons, great craftsmanship and a good deal. It's still pretty early in the morning so it might not look like it now but Hatton Garden has a real village like feel. The old buildings and happy couples shopping for wedding rings and other tokens of affection give it an air of romance. Spend a few years working here and before you know it you'll be spending far too much time gossiping in the streets. And that's the men not the women. There is nothing particularly mysterious or secretive in what goes on here. There's a well-trod and well-established route to market for all jewellery and all the associated ventures behind the scenes. There are schools here teaching the techniques as well. I guess manufacture is something that's just always been hidden. Luxury goods are sold in luxury showrooms, luxury surroundings, far removed from the workshops they're conceived in. But I think things are changing. Well, no, actually, I think things have changed. People expect to know the provenance of everything they buy, and that includes their jewellery. OK, one well, means are taken care of. It's nearly lunchtime. I need to go and pick up some rectangular stampings I've had made for some cufflinks I'd like to make. Also need to go to the Goldsmiths Hall, to the Goldsmiths Company assay office and pick up some cufflinks that I've had hallmarked and then hopefully this afternoon we can assemble them, finish them and assemble them. And along the way we can go to the pub and get some lunch. I'm going to take you to lunch somewhere very few people know about, possibly the most hidden pub in London. Hatton Garden and the surrounding streets are dotted with dimly lit doorways and little alleyways. People walk on by all day long and this little one, Eli Court, is no exception. The signs above the door go largely unnoticed and even people looking for it keep missing the tiny entrance. It's popular with ghost hunters apparently. I come for the food and the beer. There's, there's been a pub on this site of the old mitre for centuries and over the centuries it's been rebuilt and remodelled. The Mitre Tavern is believed to have been founded in 1546 for the servants of the Bishop of Eli's London House which was here. The site and adjacent properties in Eli Place were cleared after the Crown took over the area in 1772. The pub retains its early 20th century plan and fittings almost entirely intact. The court or alley runs through to this Eli place. There are some really nice townhouses. It's now home to the Gemological Institute where I learned gemology and diamond grading, although they're in a different building when I went to school. And it's home to St. Cathedral's Church. I've been to a few events in the church's underground crypt. It's an interesting place to meet. Apparently that steel pole was put in place to stop horse riders galloping through there. The current pub building, according to English Heritage, is circa 1773 with early 20th century remodelling and late 20th century extension at the rear. It's got a small bar at the front and back separated by a central bar and there's a small snug leading off the bar at the back. 
I picked up my rectangular silver stampings on the way here. They offer a new design of cufflink I'll be making, but that will have to wait for another day. If you're in the area and looking for a bite to eat, something to drink, I'd definitely hunt out the old mitre. It's only open Monday to Friday, and in the front bar, near the entrance, there's it's glazed to reveal the trunk of what is believed to be a cherry tree marking the boundary of the properties held by the Bishop of Eli and Sir Christopher Hatton, so check that out. Right now we need to walk over to Goldsmiths Hall which is in the city and pick up a small batch of cufflinks I've had hallmarked. It's, it's only a short walk so let's go. That is the end of Hatton Garden back there and we are now entering the City of London itself via Holborn Viaduct. The boundaries and all the entrances in the city are marked by dragons. I think that's the Griffin, but there are dragons all over this bridge as well. One way or another, the entrances are marked with dragons. Those end buildings are just staircases down to the lower level. They went to a lot of trouble to conceal them. Today the city or the square mile is most renowned for the finance industry and if you want to earn money and power this is where you need to work. A few of my friends do, they're clever guys, but they all dislike their jobs intensely except on one day, payday. They dislike the banality of the work, most of them tell me I'm lucky but on payday I wish I worked with them. I guess the grass is always greener on the other side. Aside from finance, there are still many livery companies here. They are trade associations. They all historically had far-reaching powers over their respective industries, especially if you wanted to trade here in the city itself. Laws here in the UK have slowly evolved and replaced many of their powers and controls. But before modern trading laws existed, they were responsible for providing regulation, training, and for the penalties of stepping outside of the regulation or laws. They were basically responsible for maintaining standards. According to the City of London, 125 livery companies are still operating, and nearly 40 have halls or premises here in the city. Not all livery companies still play an active role in their respective ancient trades. Some trades no longer even exist, and those companies exist as charities. The Goldsmiths Company, where we are headed, still retain responsibility for maintaining standards among silversmiths and jewellers. Hallmarking is a long story, and this is something that has been done for almost seven centuries, so maybe I'll make a separate film about that. It's a misconception that everything requires compulsory hallmarking though. The cufflinks we are collecting are exempt based on weight, but I support hallmarking and I aim to have all my pieces tested and marked with my hallmarks voluntarily, even if exempt. The city has its own police force separate from the rest of London. And crime here is low, but that's not through complacency, it's through intense security. Even this street lamp has a camera in it. This is Goldsmiths Hall, home of the Goldsmiths Company and the London Assay Office. The Goldsmiths Company has been here since 1339. The hall has been rebuilt a couple of times over the nearly 700 years. This latest one was built in the 1820s or 1830s. If you've ever heard or used the term hallmark as in to bear the hallmarks of someone or something, this is the origin of that phrase and where my unique hallmarks are stamped into the articles I make. It's the middle of the afternoon now, it's nearly four o'clock so I'm going to head down to the river quickly and capture sunset. I'm going to use the footage at the end of the video, not now starting to rain a little as well, I hope that holds off. Anyway, I think the sunset's a nice way to end the video. It would seem a little weird using it in the middle of the afternoon, but that's what happens. It gets dark here at about 4.30. A bit of movie magic, and we'll fix that. Okay, what can I tell you about what I just filmed? On a positive note, it didn't rain, but 
I went to film Sunset and you couldn't see the sun, it was so overcast. Luckily, I filmed Albert Bridge and as it gets as it gets darker, the illumination increases. It actually looks better at night than it does during the day. If I'd have filmed anywhere else except for maybe the London Eye where it looks better at night than it does during the day, it would have been a disaster. Okay, this afternoon we need to, I need to finish, set back, assemble and then polish the cufflinks we collected from the London Assay Office. I was just looking at some of the technical spec of my micro welder which I only serviced last week and now it's running really well. I was just checking the temperatures, the exact temperatures. Now we're going to be using a machine that runs on hydrogen and reaches temperatures between 1200 and 3300 degrees centigrade. Hydrogens have become a bit of a, a bit of a topic recently, and they're trying to, I think they're trying to develop cars that run on it. It's quite a, a green gas, so the machine we're going to use, you take a standard electrical supply, put electricity through the hydrogen cell, which contains basically water, distilled water. You put electricity through it, and through electro electrolysis, the um, it separates the water back into its component parts. So H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, you get a hydrogen and oxygen gas, which you can burn. And it says the, it is truly efficient, clean and environmentally friendly process. Prior to this chemical reaction, mixed gases are passed through the gas atomizer and delivered to the torch. As a product of the process, other than energy, the only byproduct is water. Let's take a look at it, I'll show you. This is my bench made from solid beach in the traditional design for jewellers. This is the Aqua Flames torch. Uh, the flame comes out there. This is the machine itself, the hydrogen fuel cell. So in the main cell here, you fill it with distilled water hit the main switch and that will put electricity through the water creating the oxyhydrogen gas. The gas comes out here into this atomizer. The gas is bubbled through the liquid in there which is effectively a coolant um, and then the resulting product, the hydrogen gas comes through this back into the, not back into, into the torch. I bought this machine second hand, I wouldn't recommend that, I didn't actually buy the machine, it was thrown in to sweeten the deal when I was buying another piece of equipment from a retiring jeweller in Hatton Garden. He told me it had just been serviced when I bought it, which meant it didn't need servicing for probably around another 12 to 18 months. I left it about 7 years and did it last week and I'll show you the pictures of what it looked like, it was a mess. Okay, so open the torch. And that's it. That produced temperatures of up to 3,300 degrees, which is more than hot enough to solder gold and silver. I picked up some cufflinks from the London Assay Office earlier. I'll show you how they started out before being submitted for hallmarking. These are the oval fronts. They are cut out using a cutter, they are stamped out. I try to do as much in-house as possible. I'd dig the silver out of the ground if I could, but I don't have the tooling to do every shape. So the rectangles you saw earlier, they were stamped out for us by someone with the tooling. Pick them up in Hatton Garden. That's the great thing about the clustered nature of the businesses here in London. You don't have to go far for anything. These cufflinks make a feature of my unique hallmarks and because of that the size of the hallmarks mean they have to be done in component form. The process of stamping the marks in is pretty brutal. If 
they were assembled prior to marking, the cufflink would not survive the process. It may surprise people we can have these done in component form and then to a certain extent trusted to assemble them afterwards, but it's not really a matter of trust. You either work within the scope of the law or you don't, because they now bear our unique hallmarks. If we mess around with them, it's not a matter of if we get caught, it's when we get caught. And hallmarking fraud has always carried severe penalties. It was the death penalty for a while, although we haven't had the death penalty in England for at least 50 years. But it's still 10 years in prison, and considering you only get 12 to 14 for murder, it's considered a serious crime. This is a process called setting back. We have to set back the hallmarks. The process, as I said earlier, is pretty brutal. The marks are put in using a punch, either by hand and a hammer or using a press. But the process displaces the metal and we've then got to put the ovals flat again and back in the round. We do the process entirely by hand using a hardened steel flat hammer and a hardened steel bench block. The punching of the marks displaces the metal and so does the setting back so we'll need to file them to put them back in the round we will also emery down the backs to provide a nice flat level surface to solder the back fittings onto I use a traditional jewellery bench but I have a more modern removable peg. It's a system designed originally in America for firearms engravers, for gun engravers, and they later developed systems for jewelers. So I can remove my peg, most benches have them fixed, and I can replace it with a soldering attachment. What it's primarily designed for is attaching engraving accessories. We're going to be using silver solder that melts at around 700 degrees centigrade to combine the two component parts. So we need to use a flux, we're using the traditional flux of borax in a borax tray to prevent the excessive buildup of oxides and allow the solder to flow properly between the two components. We just add a little water to the tray and then run the, run the borax cone around in the tray, it's the same as using a pestle and mortar. And we're looking for the consistency of single cream sort of milky like consistency. That's the borax mixed up for this job. We need to use a special brush to apply it as well, one that contains no metal. They are traditionally made out of uh, bird's feathers out of quills with natural bristles inserted into the end. This is a modern one made from plastic and plastic bristles but it still contains importantly no metal parts. Right so we have our oval front, it's set back, the back's been emeried flat and it's been pre-polished so we can then solder that to this swivel back, the sprung swivel back. We just need to align the two perfectly in the soldering attachment and then we can commence the soldering. So I'm going to apply a generous amount of flux to both pieces and then proceed to line them up. Once I'm happy with it we can uh, start soldering. Now soldering takes a lot of practice you need to bring the both pieces up to the temperature the solder flows at, which is around 700 degrees. You don't just melt the solder. I'm going to heat up both pieces, and both pieces are a different size. So that takes an element of control to heat two different, two completely different size pieces up to the same temperature. The reason I've switched the light off is so you can see the colour of the metal. It's very difficult to solder in direct sunlight. I wouldn't normally solder in the dark, but I do solder in quite dimly lit room. With practice you can actually tell by the colour of the metal when it's hot enough to apply the solder, when the, at the point at which the solder will flow. It's a sort of dull red. In direct sunlight you can't see the colour change, that's why I've switched the light off for this one, but I wouldn't normally solder in the dark. If you overheat the metal, if you go too far, you can, certainly with silver, you can get fire stain, you'll oxidise the metal subsurface. Worst ways, you can reticulate it so you basically melt the surface and it becomes really lumpy and bumpy. Okay, that's it. First one done. I'm just going to make sure it all stayed in place. It's hard to see in the dark. And it's still perfectly lined up. Yep, looks good. Now, it's complete from the heat, it's completely covered in... Um, oxidization and scale so we put it in what jewelers call pickle which is a weak acidic solution 
From there we'll then put it in an alkali to neutralise the acid and rinse in water. Okay, I've finished two. I would normally work in a batch. I would, it's more productive to do the whole lot. But I want a pair of these finished today for this video. So I've completed two. I've soldered two together. They've both been pickled and rinsed. You can see there's still a bit of oxidization. Actually, that's a bit of flux still on the back. So we need to clean them and then polish them. Right, for the first stage of cleaning and polishing, I'll use a satin wheel. These are used to produce a satin finish. I'll use them as my first stage of polishing. That should remove the remaining oxides and that flux from soldering. These are really popular with jewelry students. If you overheat the metal, it, if you overheat the silver, you get fire stain. It looks like a Dalmatian dog. If you mirror finish it, it becomes very obvious. If you satin finish it with one of these, you can kind of mask that fire stain because they don't know how to remove it. Right in between each stage of polishing, I'll give the items a quick clean in the ultrasonic cleaning machine. Okay, now I'm going to start on polishing proper to try and achieve a mirror finish on the front. So I remove the satinizing wheel and apply the first of the polishing mops. I'll use ever decreasing grades of polish. So I'll use a coarse, slight, well not coarse, um, a heavy mop with a coarse polish. Then clean next stage will be a slightly finer grade and a finer mop clean and then we'll repeat that four times until we've got a very fine finish on the surface the key to polishing is moving the piece repeatedly and cleanliness when i tell other jewelers that they just laugh at me because a lot of them make a right mess doing it but you have to clean the piece in between each grade of polish I even store the mops in separate drawers and I wash my hands in between each process. It prevents cross-contamination. I actually learned what I actually learned to polish jewellery when I learned watchmaking. It was something I noticed Rolex were training and their attention to detail was endless. Right, so after the final stage of polishing and their final round in the ultrasonic cleaning tank. I'll then place them in the warm air dryer just to make sure that they're dry. Okay, so I think we have our first pair of this batch finished. Let's take a closer look. Yep, all looks good. So that's our, our first pair of this batch, a pair of feature hallmark cufflinks made in sterling silver with swivel back fittings of course i'll put a link below to my shop where you can see all the items i make most of them are limited production runs so sometimes the range changes but hopefully in time i can make videos for the rest of the collection and show you how i make the the whole range So here's a, a closer look. Let me just make sure you're in focus. There we go. Oh. There we go. The swivel back. Okay, it's getting pretty late and I'm starting to get a little peckish. I'm thinking about dinner. So I think I'm going to call it a day here. I think tonight I'm going to cook. I'm going to cook some dinner 
and I'm pretty sure all we've got left in the fridge at home are the leftovers from yesterday's roast dinner. So I'm gonna to have to get a move on if I wanna make the shots before they shut. So let's go. I've decided our fancy steak for dinner. It's Monday and we had a big weekend, so Chloe's at the gym and eating only vegetables or healthy stuff. So I'm dining alone. Cooking steak is simple. It takes good beef and practice, that's it. I got to the butchers very late today, so I had little choice. They didn't have what I wanted, but they had reduced everything, so that softened the blow. I like rump steak, it's full of flavor and has a bit of a chew. But they only had sirloin left and thin ones. Ideally, you want thick cuts, about three to four centimeters thick, so you can get a good charred color on the outside and still keep it tender in the middle. The first important step is to start at room temperature. Just take the meat out of the fridge, for me here in London, that's going to take at least an hour of sitting on the side. Barbecue is the way, but in London in winter, it's not happening, so you need to get a pan that's super hot. White hot coals, hot to the point it's smoking. You're going to need to open a window. On this electric hob, that's at least five minutes on full blast. I've seasoned the steak just before cooking, and way too much, to the point if you fed it to a child, they would call the salt police. It's going to build a crust of salt and pepper, I'm using a mix of sea salt, smoked sea salt and coarse ground black pepper. Don't use any oil, that's why no oil. It will detract from the flavour of the beef. If the pan's super hot, it will not stick. Stick on the steak and flip it frequently until it's how you like it. If there's a layer of fat on the edge like this one, hold it vertically for a while to cook it. When you think it's done, stick it on a warm plate to rest for 10 minutes. How long do you cook it for? You can press the steak and gauge how it's done, but that takes practice. There are all these guides suggesting you compare it to the back of your hand and stuff. They don't work. The more steaks you cook, the more you feel, the more you eat, the better judge you will become. I used to travel a lot with a good friend and we ate steak a lot. Restaurants never nail it either. I like medium, my friend likes rare. I would always order medium rare as I knew I wouldn't get it. I got either medium or I got rare. Had I ordered medium, I probably would have got medium rare or well done. And I never want my steak well done. Rare, I don't mind. My friend always ordered rare. And much of the time, he just got raw. And raw is cold and real chewy with the sort of metallic tint of blood. While the steak was resting, I deglazed the pan a little with, I wish I could say red wine, but it was tap water to make a little gravy. Yesterday we had a roast dinner, first roast dinner of the season actually, the first roast dinner this winter, well the home, first home cooked one. And we had some leftover roast potatoes and Yorkshire puddings. So I'm having those, steak and all the carbs. Mm, that's pretty good steak. It's a little over medium. I probably should have cooked it for maybe a minute less each side, but again, like I said, it comes down to practice. This steak's a little thinner than I would normally cook. But yeah, it's great. Having it with a good dollop of English mustard. Okay, the roast spuds look nice and crispy on the outside and soft and fluffy on the inside, which is great. See how the Yorkshire puddings are. Nice and crispy on the outside and nice and fluffy on the inside. I think all this needs, the final touch, is a large glass of red wine. Found myself a glass of wine to help with the steak. A bottle of wine. I guess the one thing remaining to share to show you is tonight's sunset. Or as I explained earlier, this afternoon's getting dark. Fortunately, I filmed it at the Albert Bridge and although it's overcast, the bridge looks amazing as it transitions here from day to night. As it gets darker, the illumination increases and you get the reflection on the water and the boat. Well, you'll see. I hope you enjoy that. 
this has been a long vlog, a long video. I can tell by the amount of battery power I've consumed, the amount of footage I've shot and captured. So if you've made it this far, well, you have made it this far. Thank you for watching. I've enjoyed making it. I've enjoyed filming today. I hope you've enjoyed watching it. In the words of, to quote Anton Chekhov, the role of the artist is to ask questions, not to answer them. So I hope you have plenty to think about. Or, well, I hope you have something to think about. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments below. I try and answer as many as possible. I've certainly got plenty to think about. I said at the beginning that the inspiration of today was daily vlogging, day in the lifestyle videos, and yeah, it's, it's given me much to think about. It's certainly given me more insight into doing this every day. It's given me more respect for the people with the dedication it must require to do this day in, day out. I mean, one day was uh, was hard enough. Everything takes twice as long. If I did this every day, I'd get nothing done. I guess if you want to see behind the scenes, the best way to do that is to check out my more immediate social media. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll put link, there's links everywhere, but I'll put links at the end of the video. So for now, I hope you enjoy sunset. And until next time, doodles.